My name is Cezanne, and I'm also known as Bill Ewing. And I was rather amused when my name came up after about a year and a half to do a Dharma talk. I've been very distracted in the last year and a half trying to find a place to live. <coughs> and when I finally negotiated a new place to live, uh, I moved in on February the 15th. And then I attended the uh, urban session. And then we immediately afterwards started practicing social distancing and sheltering at home and wearing masks. I was amused at having to do a Dharma talk when my name came up on the list because when I passed this koan about a year ago in the middle of summer, Roshi, before I could leave the room, bow and leave, said, that would be a good koan for you to do your next Dharma talk with. And I was amused when I saw my name come up because it's koan number 78 from the Blue Cliff Record. The title of which is 16 Bodhisattvas Go In to Bathe. The case states, 16 in olden times, there were 16 bodhisattvas. When it came time for monks to wash, they filed in to bathe. Suddenly, they were awakened to the basis of water. All you Chan worthies, all you practitioners, how will you understand when they say, subtle feelings reveal illumination and we have arrived at the station of children of Buddha? To realize this, you must be piercing and penetrating. You know, when you're studying koans, the best advice that I got from several teachers was become the koan, be the koan. And I thought, well, I have to be one of the 16 bodhisattvas. I read the commentary and they're referred to not by name, but that is their name, the 16 bodhisattvas. And I thought about that for a little while, and I thought, well, I don't know if I can be 16 bodhisattvas. But then I remembered the first three words in the koan is, in olden times. That means it wasn't a long time ago. It was a long long time ago, probably before they started recording names. The point is that the 16 bodhisattvas became well known. They had a reputation like most monks do when they practice together. And these 16 practiced together. They slept at the same time. They did their meditation at the same time. They ate their meals at the same time. They studied their text at the same time. And as the commentary says, they were enlightened at the same time. I found this to be very informative, but I was still wondering how I could become this. And I thought, well, 
well, there was something more to it than just that. I was hooked in on the number 16, and I thought about it for quite a long time because it kept recurring, why 16? Why not 32 or 5 or 4 or 10? I knew I had heard 16 somewhere in our liturgy. So I went through my memory file up here because when I first started at the village Zendo practicing, I memorized the sutras, which we chant frequently because I knew my eyes were good enough to read them and that they wouldn't be that way very long. And sure enough, I can't read unless it's in very large print. So as I was going through my memory of them, I realized that in the Heart Sutra, where we chant the Heart Sutra and the dedication, because I remember that there are dedications after pieces, the Inmei Juku Kanungyo, which is at the end and a different dedication. The part of the sutra that's in the middle is the Shosai Mio Kichijo Durani. And because I have been a Tinzo a number of times, and one of my favorite pieces of the liturgy is the poetic dedication, which I'll recite for you now. The absolute light, luminous throughout the whole universe, unfathomable excellence, penetrating everywhere. Whenever this devoted invocation is sent forth, it is perceived and subtly answered. We dedicate these merits to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the realms of Prajna wisdom, to the 16 guardians and all protectors of the Dharma and their relations throughout space and time. So I got my answer there. They were well remembered because they protected and preserved the Dharma and passed it on to the next generation who passed it on to the next generation, and so on. Unfortunately, like many of our women's ancestors' names, and in that chant, when we chant their names, there is a phrase that goes, and all of those whose names are forgotten and left unsaid. Well, that's the 16 Bodhisattva we probably wouldn't have this practice without them. This practice has only continued for a couple of thousand years. It made it through the flu epidemic of 1917. And prior to that, I'm sure it made it through several plagues and several different passages and changes of political venues and even through periods of persecution. So I thought about how important it was that we remember them and dedicate the protective Dharani, the Shosai Mio Kichijo Dharani, to them. As a Tenzo, I chant that in the kitchen when I'm preparing food for other Bodhisattvas and Buddhas. It protects me and protects the food that they're going to be eating. I thought about the bodhisattvas that protect my sangha, who are also mentioned in that dedication. Our abbot, Roshi, in Kyo O'Hara, and the teachers at the village Zendo, which include five teachers at the Zendo and three others that no longer live in New York. And then the Hoshis, the student teachers preparing for their hopefully sensei, to become a sensei, of which we have three, four, I think, currently. 
and a couple that have already become senseis who no longer live in New York. And then I thought there's also an administration, there's an accountant and a board of directors. And there's also a website and that gets checked up on and renewed and the calendar gets changed. And when things occur in the liturgy that change, that has to be taken care of by somebody who preserves that for us. And then there's this platform that we practice on. The people that take care of that and the timers or jiki dos who begin our meetings by sounding a bell and give us a word when we finish our practice in the morning. That's well more than 16 bodhisattvas but they are all working to preserve this practice. And I am deeply and in heartfelt gratitude for that. I bow to them all, including the names that I've forgotten and left unsaid. I can't remember all of them. My memory is not that good, but I know that they're there. So what do I have left to become in this koan? I'm not going to be the narrator. I'm already a Chan practitioner. So the only thing that was left for me to become is the water. And I started thinking about what do I know about water? that they would also know, that they would become illuminated to through their subtle feelings. Aside from the fact that it's H2O and that it has a lot of physical properties, one thing is that it goes along with impermanence because water takes many forms. It can be a lake, it can be a river, it can be a mist, it can be clouds, it can be an ocean of dark clouds and an ocean of bright clouds. It can also just simply be rain and it can be an ocean. I have one story I will include about what I know about water aside from the fact that I was a swimmer and swam competitively from the age of eight until the age of 19. So for one decade in my life, a little more, I was in the pool swimming and dealing with the water for at least three to five days a week. And during the summer, it was every day for three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening. When I went camping, because I'm from Georgia, we went camping in the mountains of the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So it was usually still water. But when I came to New York, after being here for a year, a friend of mine said, I'm in the middle of the summer, I'm driving out to Jones Beach, you wanna go? And I said, sure, I'll pack a picnic for us. We went early in the morning on a Saturday and I immediately played with the waves for an hour or two before lunch. My friend complimented me by saying, you look like a dolphin out there or a seal the way you played in the water. And then he asked me, do you know how to body surf? And I said, no, will you teach me? So after a period of appropriate, a period of rest, he walk, we walked to a calm end of the beach and he said, we need to be out in about five and a half feet of water. And then he said, you need to learn how the water moves. I thought that was unusual. So we get out there, I can barely touch the bottom. We're both treading water and he says, which way is the water moving? And I just looked at him and immediately answered, the waves are going that way towards the beach. 
And he said, yes, that's the top of the water. How is the water moving from your knees down? And I could feel the sand subtly moving in the other direction. I would have loved to have seen the expression on my face. I knew he smiled because I said, it's moving that way with surprise. And he said, yes, it's moving in the other direction. The same body of water is moving in two directions at one time. The waves roll in and the ebb flows out. And then he said, you need to pay attention to that and remember that and watch it because the ebb, the flow of the ebb tide can be very strong and can carry you out into the ocean if, you aren't, if you're trying to swim against it. It's very difficult. That kept me thinking, and one of the first things it kept me thinking about was water changes and moves. It's impermanent. It's constantly moving. I also thought water seeks its own level. And on some level, that I understood when I got into Zen meditation. Sitting on my cushion, I seek my own level. In this day, in this moment, at this time. And that helps me along with the encouragement of the precepts in Buddhism to guide my life in a way that's ethical and clear. And when the waves of radical thoughts come in, or the disappointments, or the anger, I'm able to deal with them in a way that's very different than I would if I wasn't practicing. I am deeply grateful, not only for the 16 bodhisattvas who preserved this and passed it on, but for the people who preserve this in my life now. When things don't seem to be going the way I think they should, all I have to do is take a deep breath, like those waves coming in, and I ride the wave of my breath or the wave of my thoughts and let it move right back out again. I'm deeply moved by the people who protect this Dharma. They help me to guide my life in a way that I wouldn't have without it. I, I could finish this with Sway Tu's verse. But I'll leave you to read that. It's the verse from case 78. I recently wrote a poem shortly after we began our social distancing and I've been fascinated with the word beyond. And I wrote it about how can we get beyond this? How can we get through it? So, as this poem goes, I step into the light that is a surprising pool of unnamed awareness. I search the soft edge seeming to surround me like an inso, a beginning and an end, looking for the way. Wanting to move on, afraid of the unknown, I step into the dark, beyond 
the edge. Moving at an unmeasurable speed toward a tiny speck in the vast night sky, forgetting about the fading light I have just stepped out of and that it was only there a moment before I knew it and that it had come from within. Thank you for giving me the honor to speak tonight.